Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ivo Siegmann, and welcome to the Northwest Seminar Series of Mathematical Biology and Data Science. This seminar series is uh, co-organized by University of Liverpool, the University of Manchester, and Liverpool John Moores University. This is our last talk before the Easter break, but we are happy that we can um, also live stream this talk via Teams to our colleagues from Manchester and Liverpool. Um, today's speaker is Dr. Hilary Hunt. She um, comes from Oxford University uh, to us today. Um, after the Easter break, we will still have a few talks. Um, one will be presented by Dr. Maria Tatulea Codrian from Cambridge University on Wednesday, 19th April, 1 p.m. And the talk will be on asymptotic approaches to solving the n flagella problem of bacterial motility. That will be at the University of Liverpool. After that, on Monday, the 24th of April at 2 p.m., our colleagues in Manchester will host Professor Bindi Brook from Nottingham. But now, please let me introduce today's speaker. So our speaker today is Hilary Hunt, and I met Hilary actually I think nearly eight years ago, but um, that doesn't say that much because I think I met her maybe for an hour or two <laughs> because um, she was um, what she described at that time, PhD shopping. And I think <laughs> <That's right. laughs> her current stop was at the University of Melbourne at my boss's lab, Dr. Edmund, uh, Professor Edmund Crappenden. And um, yeah, I think um, I, told her a bit about my um, calcium dynamics model. And um, I think we had a good time, but um, I think what, what I heard later was that you were kind of surprised that I was gone <laughs> after you arrived, And that was because my position was nearly coming towards an end. Mm. Uh, what I learned when I researched uh, about you was that uh, something I didn't expect was that um, Apparently, you originally were not really an applied mathematician. So, uh, <laughs> not so, until that meeting. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Convinced me before over. you apparently worked on uh, not theory and I found right. quite a lot of mm -hmm. exotic stuff, but I think it's probably quite fitting because I think your PhD was, uh, you could say, on unknotting different um, calcium <laughs> signals in heart cells. And um, I think, yeah, um, you did indeed work on. Um, calcium signaling using apparently a model of the IP3 receptor and a model of the rayonidine receptor and you let them play together and uh, in the end um, you could as far as I understand uh, explain a bit better how a heart can beat while at the, at the same kind uh, at the same time the heart can grow. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so that's a very difficult problem because I think both things are done with the same calcium. But um as far as I understand, now you're doing something completely different again. So after your PhD in 2020, you directly moved to Oxford, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So uh since uh 2020, uh you are in Oxford and now you're not working on calcium anymore at all, but on hungry plants, as far as I understand. <laughs> so, yes, essentially. Now I'm looking at how plants grow instead of hearts. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to your talk on, I will actually make it more visible now, uh, on metabolism and energy bottlenecks in plant vasculature. Thanks a lot. That's right. Thanks, Eva. Um, is my microphone? It is definitely working. So just to... If no one complains, I think. It's okay, we'll wait for complaints before we do anything. Okay. Oh, well, yeah, thanks, Evo. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's very exciting to be here today. Um, yes, as Evo said, I'm now, uh, I jump fields a little bit, uh, into plant, plant biology, modeling plant biology, uh, metabolism, and energy bottlenecks. Before I get into that, though, I feel like I always need to plug plant research. Um, it's vitally important, really, because plant based food makes up 82% of the global calorie supply. And that's just the food. We also use plants for building materials, fuel, medicines. I'm sure you can think of um, dozens of others. Um, but agriculture uh, actually takes up a huge proportion of Earth's habitable landmass. I've got this really nice plot on the right here from our world in data, which shows 
over 29% of the Earth's surface is actually land, 71% uh, of that is habitable land, not that habitable land, a whole 50% of that is um, slated towards agriculture, um, which is great for now. It service, it, uh, we, get, we get all the uh, plant-based material we need right now, but that's uh, with today's population, which as you may be aware, passed 8 billion sometime last year and is uh, predicted to increase by another 25% by 2050 to 10 billion. And um, 2050 is actually not that far away these days. So, and as you may also have heard on the news, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a push and pull between making more land for agriculture to feed our Earth's growing population and uh, actually keeping parts of the Earth wild and biodiverse and uh, actually having beautiful natural places in the world as well. And there are, there are a whole bunch of different solutions um, that we could come up for with that. So, I mean, for example, you can see the division in agricultural land between uh, meat and crops. Uh, but one of the nicest uh, solutions for everyone, including uh, keen meat eaters, is to just increase the efficiency with which we grow our crops. Um, so, and they're actually just like there are a whole bunch of ways of uh, keeping our planet biodiverse. There are a whole bunch of ways we can increase the efficiency of crop growth. Uh, a lot of research in this field goes into photosynthesis, uh, increasing the efficiency with which plants convert solar energy essentially um, into sugars, the energy to fix carbon dioxide. Uh, there's also a lot of really interesting research that goes into concentrating carbon dioxide in the plant so they can fix more efficiently. efficiently. Uh, the specific method I'm looking into is um, looking at how we can potentially increase the transport of this carbon around the plant. So it gets from the fixing organs of the plant, which are basically the leaves, the green parts, um, to the actual productive parts of the plant. So in general, that's the shoots, the seeds. Uh, sometimes it's the roots, we get tubers. Um, and so I'm gonna talk you through a lot of my research into looking at exactly how we might do this. And uh, I suppose talking about showing you that uh, it is actually another viable route of increasing um, agricultural production. So to start with, I've got this really nice figure from uh, Cadill et al, 2016, where they had a look at what happens if you just overexpress one proton pump in, uh, in plants, and they expressed it constitutively, so throughout the whole plant, and they also expressed it in just the phloem. Um, and you can see that uh, actually expressing in just the phloem has about the same effect as if you express it constitutively. Uh, and that effect is, if you have a look at those y-axes, almost 100% increase in growth in both the shoots and the roots, which is astonishing. Um, and uh, implies there's actually something really interesting, there's some really uh, viable targets in the floor that we can um, engineer or manipulate to increase agriculture. But actually, I should, I should backtrack a bit uh, and explain what phloem is. So phloem, essentially plants have two types of vasculature, the phloem and the xylem. Uh, I'm gonna focus on the phloem, which is the sugar transporting vasculature. So that's the veins within the plant, within plants, uh, and I should specific, it's a specific types of plants. I'm actually going to talk throughout this talk about uh, Arabidopsis, which is the plant that Kadilka et al. did their experiments in. And it's actually very closely related to a lot of crop plants. So a lot of the brassicas, their phloem works in a similar way. Um, and so yes, this is the vasculature that transports all of those sugars from the leaves to uh, the source tissues, to the sink tissues, the roots, the tubers, the seeds. Um, Okay. Oh, and here I've got a nice uh, schematic diagram I forgot I'd made. There we go. That's the direction of uh, carbon flow in an Arabidopsis on the right there. Okay. So, I'll just give you a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about, just because there's going to be a lot of background uh, on how plants work, how phloem actually works, before I can get into why my model is actually so amazing uh, and what it actually says. Uh, so I'll start with um, how we think phloem actually works in these kinds of plants. 
I'll get into uh, how we model that, what the difficulties are, because there's a lot of difficulties in the complexity of, um, I've chosen to do it metabolically, because my group is a metabolic, uh, metabolic modeling group. <clears throat> and then what our, what our modeling actually says about why Cadill Cardell's results might have been so astounding, and what we think are actually other viable targets in the floor. And then more research that I'm currently doing, because, you know, it's a never ending story. So uh, let's get to it. OK, so essentially, what's interesting about plant vasculature um, is that it works completely differently to um, the uh, the way that plants drive the flow in their vasculature is completely different to how it works in animals. So actually, this has been um, a really large change from uh, human hearts, which I worked in in my PhD. Um, we, we know that the transport of sugars and other metabolites and so on is driven by differences in concentration between the source tissues and the sink tissues. So concentrations are very high around the leaves and the drop in concentration where it's all taken up by the sink tissues um, drives the entire flow, we think, of um, the flow and sap. Uh, which is really um, a really neat way of doing things. And what it means is that the energy input that the plant has to do in order to keep these uh, sugars moving is all in keeping that concentration gradient in place, uh, which means that what the plant needs is um, a whole bunch of pumps, which ensure that, that we have a much higher concentration near the source leaves than the sinks. Nope. Nope. Not important interruption. Okay, great. So I thought that might have been someone online saying uh, we need a microphone turned up. Okay, so uh, here in this diagram, we've got the source cells, which are, uh, I will later be calling mesophyll. I'll probably swap between leaf cells, mesophyll, etc. It's generally the main photosynthesizing cells in the leaves. They produce a whole bunch of sugars via photosynthesis, and they're those sugars generally just diffuse out of those cells into the apoplast, which is the extracellular space. Uh, remember that term too, if you can, uh, because I'll be mentioning that a bit as well. Once it's in those, the extracellular space, unfortunately, it can't just diffuse into companion cells and then into the phloem, because that concentration gradient uh, that would go against the concentration gradient. So this is where the active, the energy um, that goes into plant, trans, plant sugar transport comes in. Companion cells have to actively take up all those sugars. And then once they're taken up, there's a massive concentration of sugars in companion cells. And then in these types of plants, it, it just, the sugar just diffuses from them. They're symplastically linked. So they're cytoplasms, uh, essentially one contiguous. And it just flows down into the sieve elements the uh, essentially the straw cells. I'll come back to all this later um, and flows along to the source uh, sink. OK, and if we zoom in even closer here, we can see this is the colors are approximately the same. So but I also have labels at the bottom. We've got the source over there on the right, the apoplast, the companion cells. We know sugars are taken up into companion cells via these proteins called um, sucrose proton symporters. Essentially, they work because there's a big concentration gradient on the plasma membrane of companion cells. And they uh, bring in both a sugar molecule and a proton at the same time down the proton concentration gradient, even though it's up the, uh, the sugars. So uh, we get tons of sugar in companion cells, which is great. We also get massive acidification because of all those protons coming in. And they need to be pumped straight back out. And they are pumped. by We know this pump uh, in purple here called the proton ATPase pump that just uh, hydrolyzes ATP to get those protons out. But the thing is, Cadil Cartel uh, overexpressed this other protein, which is a proton pyrophosphate, uh, pyrophosphatase. And that's another, potentially another proton pump that could be hydrolyzing pyrophosphate and then using that to continue pumping out these sugars. Or it could potentially be running in the opposite direction. Uh, so I should backtrack a little again and say we don't actually know a huge amount about the metabolism of these cells. Because uh, veins, as you can imagine, they're quite small in humans. They're smaller in smaller animals. They're uh, 
really quite tiny in these tiny little Arabidopsis plants. Um, so they're very hard to isolate and run experiments on. You can do some 13C or 11C experiments to see where carbon is going, but seeing exactly what's happening um, is very tricky. So this is where the modeling comes in, and this is also where the uncertainty comes from. We're not actually sure if it's hydrolyzing pyrophosphate to pump out these protons, or it's going the opposite direction. It's actually also taking advantage of the proton gradient, pumping these, uh, allowing these protons into the cell to uh, synthesize pyrophosphate. And pyrophosphate could also be used in this catabolism process here to produce more ATP. Um, essentially, the energy for this uh, whole system is, we think maybe, coming from breaking down these sugars uh, producing and producing ATP from glycolysis and the TCA cycle, mitochondria, et cetera, um, and then using that to pump the protons, to pump in even more sugars. And that process can be, can pump, uh, can create even more ATP. If we substitute pyrophosphate for ATP in some of those catabolism reactions, um, it's very hard to tell. It's uh, one of the things that's inconclusive from the data. Um, and another reason we need this model. All right. So um, the two key questions I want to answer in this talk are, um, are the two companion cell proton pumps working in tandem, or is it actually that the proton pyrophosphatase pump is working in the opposite direction to just make more ATP? So they're both. Uh, so the ATP proton pump is working extra hard. Um, and also, where's the energy from the pumps come from? So we're fairly sure it, these cells have got to be breaking down some of the metabolites they're getting from mesophyll cells um, to be providing all of their energy. But there are other ways plant cells can get energy. There's uh, photosynthesis. They do have a few very small chloroplasts, which presumably are doing something. Um, they could be breaking down something other than the sugar. Uh, we'll get to that. OK. But to get to that, we have to work, we have to put together all of the metabolism of the companion cells, the source cells, the sieve elements, and make sure that everything we know about them is all working in tandem to uh, to actually pump uh, as much phloem sap out as possible. Otherwise, we could be missing some crucial aspect, uh, which means we have to take into account all of the sources of energy. So we've got the mitochondria which are involved in uh, breaking down the sugar into ATP. We've got the chloroplasts. We've got all the other metabolic processes that go into uh, a working cell. So um, you can see, actually, do you know what? I, I won't go through it. Uh, believe me when I say we've taken all of the reactions that we expect are part of the core me metabolism of these plant cells and uh, stuck them all into our model, which, um, looks a little awful when you put it all together. We got the stoichiometry of all of these reactions. Um, but that's OK. Somebody else did this, so <laughs> I didn't have to go through it all. This is all, uh, there's a lot of experiments. As you might know, stoichiometry is not always exactly, uh, exactly the uh, amounts you get of each metabolite go coming in and the exact amounts you get coming out as products. But we've taken the average, what we think is the average from a whole bunch of experimental evidence. And we're going to run our model over both the light period and the dark period of this plant's life. So it's long enough, hopefully the average will be fine. OK, we stick all of that together into one large network where we connect all of these reactions. And this is, don't, don't worry too much about this. This is essentially, ooh, this is one of those slides that always goes a little funny on other computers. Oh, well, uh, pretend it's beautiful. <laughs> um, this is essentially the structure of the metabolism, the core metabolism in one cell. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of cells. We mush all that together. And uh, then really, one of the only ways to deal with this uh, huge metabolic network is with flux balance analysis. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with flux balance analysis. Uh, I'll take you through it quickly, um, just to make sure. Essentially, we've got a huge table list, et cetera, of uh, reactions. We take the stoichiometry of each of those reactions, and we put it into a huge stoichiometric matrix with the metabolites as the rows, the reactions as the columns. 
and then uh, we also add in things like uh, flow and export. So, and that's nice and conveniently being measured. So we can say, well, actually, flow should be exported with like this ratio of sucrose to amino acids to whatever else. We have the import and export. Uh, well. I suppose input output reactions. So uh, that's things like photons coming into the system, carbon dioxide, oxygen, water. Uh, we have all of that. And then once we've got our stoichiometric matrix, we know that we can take a vector, which is essentially a vector of the flux through each of those reactions, and any vector multiplied by that matrix that gives us um, the null space is going to be the vector of physically possible. Uh, fluxes through each of those reactions. So uh, that narrows down potentially what's happening in our um, in our system by a huge amount. As you can imagine, um, before that network I showed you had uh, maybe 800 reactions. Uh, when we've got all the cells in the light phase and the dark phase, we end up with about 8,000. So uh, huge, we actually we end up with a massive space of physically possible reactions. Then we want to narrow that down further. Uh, through a lot of assumptions and uh, data weighting to get a smaller space of physically plausible uh, reaction fluxes that we can then do some analysis on. So, um, and here I've actually, I think I'll come back to this slide. Uh, I think, yes, pretty sure I'll come back to it later. <laughs> okay, so narrowing it down, the way we do that, we started off with, um, in my group, we have, we already had a model of the core metabolism, um, a flux balance analysis model for uh, cells in the leaf. So the musical cells, the source cells, which is great because they're quite complicated. Um, probably the most complicated of the cells. And we can simplify that model, just get all the other cell types, which is excellent. Uh, we have the sieve elements I already mentioned, which are basically just straws with uh, little organelles on the side. There's just the whole cytoplasm just sort of streams through as flow and sap. Um, and companion cells, which are those pump cells. Uh, they also keep the sieve elements alive because sieve elements, being straws, can't really do much else. So they do a lot of things like make the proteins, um, send potentially mRNA and nutrients to the sieve elements. Okay, and they're a lot simpler. So to start with, sieve elements don't have a lot of organelles we expect in regular cells. They don't have nuclei because uh, they just get in the way. So there's no transcription to worry about. They don't have chloroplasts, so they don't fit the size. We can um, strip out a whole bunch of reactions because of that, which is nice and convenient. Uh, no vacuoles either, which for those of you who don't work in plants are essentially the storage organelles of um, sugars and amino acids and things like that. Basically just big storage uh, compartments. Um, and they potentially have standard mitochondria. So we weren't, the evidence for that was not particularly conclusive on exactly how they were stunted. So we just played around a little bit with those reactions to see if anything interesting came out. Um, not really, I won't talk about that too much. Okay, and then companion cells. Uh, essentially, the main difference we could find between them and uh, mesophyll cells, the source cells, is there were a lot less of them in the leaf and they had fewer and smaller chloroplasts. So we standard the ability of chloroplasts. We put some constraints on the maximum photosynthesis flux we'd allow. Um, they were potentially stunted in that they couldn't perform uh, photosynthesis, uh, photosystem two reactions, but we were also, that evidence wasn't conclusive. So played around with that too, and I also won't talk about it. Just know most of the, pretty much all the conclusions they come to are valid with or without photosystem two. Okay, and then we had to put them all together. So we added the, uh, diffusion from mesophyll cells or cells to apoplast, that's all very easy. Uh, then we added the active uptake of those sugars and amino acids from the source cells, the companion cells, and then we just added some plastic transfers between sieve elements. So there's a bit of, um, we had to think, have a good think about the ratios of each cell in the leaf, because there's many fewer companion cells than either the source cells or the sieve elements. Uh, but otherwise, that's about what you'd expect it to be. Um, whole bunch of other considerations like the maintenance of cells. We also have to consider if we're considering the energetics of the whole system. So they do actually require some energy to stay alive, to refresh proteins, to refresh um, the, uh, I suppose, the plasma membranes, all of that. Um, there's some other parts of phloem that I will 
maybe come back to if anyone has questions. <laughs> okay, and then we stack all of that into our flux balance analysis. So uh, what I didn't talk about earlier is that once we had all of that together, we could say, well, okay, we've got this big tissue, massive tissue model, and we want to narrow down that solution space by saying we added in all those constraints. We had some really nice transcriptome data, which is essentially uh, single cell RNA measurements uh, for companion cells and for the source cells, those musical cells, but not for sieve elements because they don't have nuclei. Uh, so we added that in um, with basically a least squares mapping, uh, at least squares weighting, I suppose, on any reactions that we could not map those transcripts to. And we said, oh, well, probably the whole aim of our system is to export as much fluorum as possible. Um, which really yeah, gave us a much smaller solution space, which is great. Unfortunately, it's, uh, we come back to this long list of reactions and we just get that long vector of uh, potential, potential um, fluxes for each reaction. And remember, through the rest of this, this is um, we're optimizing our system to maximize the amount of flow coming out. So these are all maximal. We basically have a range now for every reaction we're looking at that our, our model thinks is plausible in Arabidopsis flow tissue, which is really exciting because then we can go back to those pumps I talked about earlier. And uh, a question of do they work in tandem or is actually is the proton pyrophosphatase pump working in the opposite direction to just make more and more ATP is now much easier to answer. I mean, assuming you believe my model. <laughs> so essentially, we had a look and um, the range of that pump is from not basically not working at all. I think it actually had very slim amount of uh, pumping protons to pumping all the protons because well, maybe our model could have had a few more constraints if we'd known what those values would have been. But, um, which is really interesting. Um, we had also added in a constraint to minimize the whole sum of fluxes so that um, that means there's less maintenance. So we want to both, once it's exporting the maximum amount of flow, we want to minimize all those flow, uh, fluxes so it doesn't have to renew enzymes as frequently and all that. So make sure that wasn't just a sum of fluxes thing. We forced it to actually pump backwards for a bit. And we found that um, the, do I say that on this slide? Hmm. Oh, okay, doesn't matter. Um, and we found that the, the total output of the whole model decreased when we told them that protein it had to go backwards. So we're fairly confident, basically because of the, uh, because there's a lot of pyrophosphate already produced by a whole bunch of biosynthesis reactions. So um, it gets produced in protein uh, synthesis and cellular synthesis, essential, uh, et cetera. Um, and we saw a lot of mRNA abundance for those reactions in our transcripts so that weighted them more heavily. Um, we're fairly confident that this proton pyrophosphatase pump is actually working as a proton pump, like the ATP, uh, proton ATPase pump. So actually, that was very exciting. Um, and we found our model indicated, this is based on a whole bunch of assumptions we made about how much biosynthesis is actually happening, that the proton pyrophosphatase pump could actually be the dominant pump if there was enough of that enzyme. And we expect potentially that's maybe what's happening in the Katilka at our results. I mean, potentially a little bit too much uh, supposition there. Okay. So, uh, and so the, the reason that we found out it probably wasn't running backwards is because um, that puts too much pressure on the, the proton gradient in companion cells. So maybe I should uh, go forward a little bit, well, backtrack a little more. We expected actually that this, this boundary between companion cells and the apoplast, where they had to be pumping in all of these sugars to maintain that concentration gradient for to, uh, to pump all of the, or essentially pump all of those sugars through the plant was going to be um, the primary energy bottleneck in our whole system. And as we expected, uh, our model said exactly the same thing. It was like, yeah, actually the main, the main sticking point here is that companion cells are really just struggling to get the energy to maintain that proton gradient. 
Um, but interestingly, the reason that the reason that the um, pump, the proton pyrophosphatase pump, couldn't work backwards is because while there's a energy bottleneck right there on that uh, companion cell plasma membrane, there's actually a carbon bottleneck in the amount of carbon that our source cells could fix. And that's, we added that in based on known limitations of the amount of carbon a leaf could fix based on the concentra carbon concentrations and the amount of light we told our leaves they were getting, um, which is actually potentially even more interesting than uh, knowing which way that pump is going and what that pump's actually doing when we overexpress it. Because that means that any, any uh, alterations, any bioengineering we want to do to improve the efficiency of um, phloem export in plants has got to address, could address either one or the other. So we saw potentially just increasing the pump, um, pump capacity increase the growth of plants. And that was in optimal greenhouse conditions though. I should also say uh, greenhouse versus field, you get very different results with the much less controlled uh, crops. But any, any bioengineering want to do to try and um, increase plant growth, plant, uh, agricultural efficiency will do best if it addresses both of these problems, both the energy limitation at that companion cell apoplast interface and the carbon limitation. So, which is um, great because I don't have to go to all the other people in uh, plant science and say, ah, no, phloem is, phloem is way more important than your carbon fixing and photosynthesis stuff. It's all actually going to make quite a large difference, we expect. <laughs> okay, great. So that's question one. Uh, question two was, uh, where is that energy coming from? And um, I suppose I probably should have partially answered it here, where I said the carbon limitation, uh, well, I should have said, the carbon limitation of these uh, source leaves means that if the pump's going backwards and it's producing pyrophosphate to increase the output, the ATP output of uh, sucrose catabolism, then that's consuming too much sucrose with, and is then having to release too much carbon because the source cells can only fix a certain amount of carbon. We just assumed they were uh, as wild type source cells that are uh, doing essentially um, what leaves currently do. Uh, and so by doing that, while we did completely solve, well, that could completely solve the energy bottleneck there, we just can't output as much because we've well, our plants eaten it all before it gets to any other part of the plant. And that's not what we want from our plant source tissues. Um, and so really interestingly, keep in mind this is an optimal model. So it is actually still catabolizing uh, some of the metabolites from the source cell. But actually the majority of the energy to uh, maintain those pumps um, in companion cells is coming from the chloroplasts, those um, hugely constrained chloroplasts. I think we constrained it to something like a 20th of the efficiency of the source cell chloroplasts because of the size and the number and also the much uh, smaller companion cells. And I'm still predicted that during the day, the majority of energy for those pumps could be produced from these chloroplasts, uh, which is really interesting because I've got a, I've got a diagram here of, uh, I suppose, photosynthesis in companion cell chloroplasts. And then on, on this on the left, and then on the right, a diagram of the Kelvin cycle. And you can see in blue is the mesophyll flux. That's what's happening in the source cells. We're getting the energy coming in from uh, the photosystems in photosynthesis, and it's being used to fix carbon, and it's going around in that cycle. And you're, you're getting a lot of carbon dioxide coming in at the top there. But in orange, in the companion cells, we're only getting part of that cycle, the part that's producing a whole bunch of uh, ATP and not fixing any carbon at all, which is hard to tell exactly how uh, realistic that is. There are, so that um, Rubisco, the enzyme that fixes carbon, is present in companion cell chloroplasts. People have looked and they found it. It's actually present in pretty much all plant cells. So potentially it is still fixing a small amount, but optimally, um, Optimally, we wouldn't want it to fix any carbon. We want all of that energy going towards the proton pumps, which 
might be an exciting target for uh, any experimentalists. We haven't managed to convince anyone to target it yet, but I'm sure we'll get there. Um, how am I going for time? Oh, OK. Uh, I need to hurry it up. OK, so uh, skip through to we had a quick look at how energy actually gets out of chloroplasts um, because there are a whole bunch of don't worry too much about all the details. Essentially, there's a whole bunch of routes it could take. Um, and then we also see that we get both ATP and NADH, that's the reducing power coming out of these chloroplasts, and that's all going to the mitochondria, which also uh, do a lot of work in companion cells. Um, I might skip through that to, oh, one other small result from this model is that um, it's also possible that companion cells are getting energy from amino acid synthesis. So I think I very briefly mentioned earlier that phloem sap has both sugars and amino acids in it, uh, primarily sucrose um, and amino acids. And a lot of these amino acids we expected to be synthesized in the mesophyll cells because they've got all the energy and all the carbon fixation and they're um, really all the resources to synthesize them. But what we found is you can actually, I mean, I suppose it was known before, you can synthesize some amino acids by uh, partially catabolizing other amino acids. And in our model, we said, and we're, we think this is true, but this is also one of those things where it's very hard to tell right now with current experiments, that the cost of importing each, we said the cost of importing each amino acid would be the same for companion cells. And so we found in our model, when it's all optimized, it said, well, let's just import the high energy uh, amino acids that we can break down into other amino acids that we also need. Uh, while releasing ATP or reducing power. So yeah, very interesting. There's companion cells there in the second cell to the right. This is the four cell types in my model, which I haven't quite explained, but there's the source cells on the left, companion cells, and then two different types of sieve elements because there's the sieve elements in the leaf and the sieve elements further down um, that are a bit further removed from the source cells. And you can see the companion cells, there's actually these arrows all indicate synthesis of a different amino acid. Some of them are mushed together because there wasn't much room in the diagram. But there's quite a bit of um, amino acid synthesis in companion cells, which is a big surprise. Um, and also, it would be nice if we could convince some uh, experimentalists to uh, look into that, see if it's actually happening. Or, um, but we think that's uh, optimally, there's a fairly good chance that that is what uh, companion cells are doing in flowing tissue. All right. OK, so that's. Uh, our entire FBA phloem loading model. So we're looking specifically at the um, at the energetics of actually getting all of those sugars into the phloem. Uh, and that work's been published. Uh, I think I've got a QR code later on uh, if you're interested. Um, it's uh, in plant physiology. It's either published was either published this week or last week. Give it a few days, maybe. <laughs> so that's very exciting. Um, and then since then, how much time? Okay, five minutes. Five minutes to go through all the exciting stuff we've been doing since. Okay, since then, that's actually just one small part of the whole flow and transport system. Um, and so we think it's the most important. There's actually a whole bunch of vasculature between the source and the sink. And there is actually stuff going on there. So there's sieve elements. They're sort of uh, believed to be fairly metabolically inert. But uh, we know from, um, well, I suppose the fact that they're alive, but they've got to be at least, uh, they've got to have at least some minimum amount of metabolic activity to stay alive. Um, there's also leakage that happens. They're all in the, uh, the cell boundaries need to be slightly, um, they need to allow sucrose through so that it can actually leave the phloem eventually. Um, and we expect there's probably some differences in how porous they are to sucrose uh, as you go along. But leakage and also uh, recapture of that sucrose is going to play a big uh, role in how much sucrose actually makes it to the sink tissues. Um, so we've been looking at, um, I suppose, the fluid dynamics of what's happening once it's all in the phloem and makes its way to the sink. Um, so yeah, I suppose there's the uh, previous studies have estimated sucrose leakage between one and five percent per centimeter, which there's not been a huge amount of experimental measurements of that. 
Because as you can imagine, one in five percent per centimeter quickly trails off to nothing, astonishingly quickly for um, crops that are, you know, potentially a meter, meter and a bit tall. So we expect that um, there's a huge amount of variation there, um, and one percent might be too high a lower bound. Um, so we've been looking into that, uh, how much leakage we can actually expect in the stem versus the roots, um, and also the uh, proportions of the phloem. So this is a nice figure I found in um, a paper by Hartel in 2007, where they looked at uh, the different morphology of phloem in, this is the petiole, so that part where the leaf joins the stem of a plant. And you can see it's just the first and the third row that are petiole cross sections. The other two rows are zooming in on the vascular bundle where the phloem is. You can see there's huge variation there in the number of cells in the vascular bundle, the number of cells that make up the phloem, um, the spacing of those cells. That's got to play a huge, um, huge part in how effective phloem is. Uh, so I think I'd better skip through this very quickly. But suffice to say, we expect morphology to play a huge amount, um, a huge role in how efficient phloem is. And potentially, the um, structure of a plant could play a huge part in um, how efficient they, uh, they are at actually producing the edible bits that we want. So it's a current project. Uh, another project which we're mostly wrapping up. Hopefully, we'll get a preprint out in the next month. Uh, it's looking at the right at the other end at the roots, so the sink tissues, and looking at what's happening there, how they grow, uh, how metabolism affects that. Because like phloem, they're also quite delicate, and you know you have to dig them up and damage them, and it's quite hard to tell what's happening metabolically. So uh, it's another part of phloem metabolism, uh, um, of plant metabolism that's really worth modeling to just narrow in on what's happening there. So that's with a, a master student, Stephen Leap, who's now left. But um, yeah, we should be publishing that very soon. All right, and um, to thank the Sweet Love group, this is my group, who've uh, been uh, discussed this with me, had many fruitful discussions with all of them. Uh, the Flom Dakota Consortium, who I'm working with, um, who are partly with BASF, who funded the entire project, uh, along with Oxford University. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Oh, this is old. Yes, it's now been now been published. Ignore the bioarchive part. Thanks a lot, Henry. Um, I would like to ask if there are any questions here in the just or online. So there's one question here. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, very interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering when you were talking about the flow and loading depend on proton gradient. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've got PPI uh, plus H2O. And oh, yeah. Whether it was a reversal reaction, then you were saying later on that the model uh, indicated that it's the forward reaction that is. Yeah. So I was just wondering whether there is any. Um, sort of kinetic uh, data about the equilibrium of that re reaction, and then yes. you did sort of um, compare that to the ratio. Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Um, I have looked into it, um, and it's inconclusive. So we actually we do get the same protein on the vacuole of um, most plant cells, and in that on the vacuole, it's um, pumping protons into the vacuole and hydrolyzing pyrophosphate, uh, the PPI. Um, but then somebody's actually gone and done the thermodynamic equilibrium calculations uh, with estimates of the concentrations of the plasma membrane and uh, the temperature and all of that. And it's come back very inconclusive. So I expect, actually, there's a, there's a fair chance that it would, it could go in either direction and it would depend on how much pyrophosphate, free pyrophosphate there actually is available. Uh, at the time and potentially on how strong that proton gradient is. But yeah, it was um yeah, the it was it was very close to I just think it might have been nice validation. It would have 
it was yeah it, it was very disappointing and i was like uh, it's sort of <laughs> very inconclusive i mean honestly slightly in the other direction to where we think it's going but um it is known to pump in either direction in different plants and different settings so are there any more questions online or in here okay um Thanks. So I have a, probably a very naive question because it's not my field at all, but thanks, yeah. for, a, thanks for a nice talk. Um, yeah, my understanding of the model was sort of an optimal approach based on maximizing flow and flux or minimizing energy. Yep. Um, is there any necessary reason why that is the case? <laughs> it could be chanting that these plants might have developed some mechanism that's not necessarily the optimum. Um, yeah. So, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so I suppose we expect it to be the case through evolution to the <laughs> uh, an optimum. But as you know, evolution is not always optimal. And uh, so we actually we don't expect in vivo plant metabolism to look exactly like this. We actually expect it to be uh, quite a bit less efficient. And so one of the challenges with this kind of modeling is working out what's actually likely to be happening and what's actually potentially just the model being like, actually in the in ideal world, this is what's happening. Um, so, oh, I forget where I was going with this, but yeah, essentially um, a lot of our, a lot of our results of what's happening, we sort I well, I suppose I have to go and talk to a lot of biologists and say, okay, so my model says it's doing this and this and this and this, and they'll be like, oh yeah, no, that sounds right. Yeah, no, that one. And then they'll be like, Oh no. no, maybe that could be a target. So a lot of, um, I suppose, and a lot of the analysis of these models does depend on a fairly thorough knowledge of uh, plant metabolism that I'm slowly creeping towards, I hope. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and then also plants don't actually, as we can see from the Cadilca et al data, you know, they they could, um, the efficiency can be improved, which is why this is all worth doing in the first place. Um, and whether that uh, efficiency is because evolution hasn't led them to the most efficient solution, or I think what's more likely is there's a good chance that this is one of those um, protective kinds of mechanisms where it generally seems sort of superfluous until I expect something like drought conditions or lack of nutrients or potentially even just um, I don't know, a few days of um, too many clouds. This could be one of those measures where it can switch it between the two um, and it's not necessarily um, inefficient. It's just, um, yeah, protective. So I suppose if we do find, um, there's a fair chance we'll do this and we'll be like, oh yeah, giant plants, we have giant plants now. And they'll just die after a couple of cloudy days if we don't take good care of them. So. Yeah, it's hard to tell until, you know, the experiments have all been done, which end of the, yes, this already happens to, yes, this is a great idea to, it's too, it's too efficient, it's too streamlined, um, we're, we're landing on here. But yeah, great question. Well, I have a question as well. Uh, so, I understand that in the end, the um, final aim is that uh, once you have understood how um, cell meta uh, plant metabolism works a bit better. Um, you would like to identify some ideas how you can optimize the plant. So um, based on these results, how uh, far do you think you are from saying, OK, this is probably a part of this metabolic network where I would like to maybe change things a bit? <laughs> um, well, I suppose actually it just about every stage of the model, I've been like, okay, these look like great, these look like great targets. Um, and actually, so yes, I can already say from this, you know, I think, I think this, this, and this would be good things to try. But um, I suppose, as I sort of hinted at earlier, my knowledge of plant metabolism is such that some of them, oh, and and the experimental side of things, a whole bunch of them, the experimentalists will be like. That's too hard. No, too much effort. <laughs> Not worth it, even for whatever theoretical gains. Um, and some of them will be like, ah, yeah, great. Um, and so we've got, um, 
we've got experimental collaborators who are looking into the, I suppose, the likelihood and viability of some of these targets we've identified. And hopefully that those results come out really soon. Um, it's always hard to tell how long experiments are going to take. So, but yes, we have we have already gotten to the stage where we're like, yes, do this and this and this. This will be great. Um, we'll see. We'll see how uh, how that goes. So they have a project works like this. So you come up with a list of potential targets, and then you speak with the people, and then they um, reduce this list to maybe one or two, and yep. uh, then one or the other is tried, and then. It might still happen that the plant uh, decides that it's uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's uh, still a chance that that happens, and they come back and they're like, "No, rubbish. You gave us rubbish. Put that back in the world and be like, "No, this doesn't work." <laughs> and then it'll come up with new targets and yeah, try again. Um, but yeah, it's a slow pr process. I think the transforming the plants to uh, either knock out or overexpress any genes we're interested in and then growing those plants to sufficient point where they're big enough to tell if anything's changed and then uh, also there's um, metabolomics and proteomics and all of that that uh, gets done it's um, at I guess minimum a year I think so <laughs> yeah um, we've got yeah I think it's looking from the thing maybe with some of them but it's too early to tell well thanks a lot um i don't think there are any more questions here and i don't see anyone online so um let's thank hillary again thanks for coming everyone <laughs>